back to First Peter, and uh, we uh, came on down through to verse number eight last time, or verse number nine <clears throat> in First Peter. And I want to <clears throat> I want to pick the thing up, and I'm going to teach and preach coming through First Peter. And I've got to find me the page first of all. I hope I didn't leave it at home. <laughs> I have a hard time teaching with all my material sitting at home. Here we go. Never seen a Bible like that, did you? <laughs> Almost start off without a portion of it, and then it's getting hot up here, man. He's likes to do the trick. We're not going to worry about it this winter. <laughs> uh, first Peter chapter 1 now. <clears throat> and you understand as far as the context, First Peter, you understand that the theme of First Peter is Christian suffering. And uh, I can't see too well now, Harold. Turn, turn it back up where I can see. <laughs> okay, that's real good there. And uh, you understand that from about several places in the Word of God. In fact, every, every chapter in First Peter deals with suffering. And you might as well face the fact that not everything's going to be a bed of roses. You're going to have the good times. You're going to have the bad times. You're going to have everything in between as far as the Christian life uh, is concerned. And so we want to realize that. We don't want to buckle under the load. Whenever the trials and temptations come, even if they be many, even if they be manifold, we don't want to buck under the load. We want to realize it. Well, it's just simply the trying of our faith. It's more precious than gold. And one day if we come through that thing like we should, uh, well, then the Bible says when Jesus Christ comes back, we'll be praised for that. And then the Bible says because of all that, you and I are supposed to love the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, Whom having not seen, ye love. And whom though now yet you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full glory, receiving the end of your salvation, uh, your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Uh, then as far as the salvation of your souls is concerned, that part is complete. As far as the salvation and redemption of your body is concerned, that part is not complete. That will be complete at the second coming of Jesus Christ. All right, now verse number 10 says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching water what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Uh, in verse number 10, it says, What salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Well, you know what the prophets did. The problem the prophets had was they'd get writing something down and didn't even realize what they uh, wrote. God said, no, right. And they'd get writing. And they'd get writing and all of a sudden they look back and say, now, what is that? And they get talking about the, the grace that should come unto you. They get talking about his suffering. Uh, they get talking about his glory that should follow. They say, well, now, how can that be? We're talking about his suffering. We're talking about his glory. There ain't no glory in, in his suffering. And they get talking about that thing. They could never get the difference there. I mean, sometimes in your Bible, back in the Old Testament, you get reading about that thing. And you read about in the same verse as suffering his glory in one verse. And uh, they couldn't get the difference. They'd search diligently. You know, I, I sometimes think about Christians. I mean, here we are on the other side of all that. And we're on the New Testament side of that thing. We're indwelt by the Holy Ghost of God. Uh, we've got some light as far as the Word of God's concerned. And Christians don't search their Bibles diligently. I mean, you and I, we ought to search some things out. We ought to dig in the Word of God. We ought to get in the Word of God, stay in the Word of God. We ought to plow through that thing. We ought to dig and we ought to search it diligently. I mean, sometimes because we have so much dumped on us, we don't search. And sometimes we need to search and get in there and dig for yourself. Sorry, thing you ever heard is that, uh, I'll tell you, is this idea of, you know, Brother Martin said, or Brother Ruckman said, or Brother Cummins said, or Brother somebody else said. I mean, what you want to do is get in the Word of God and get some things down straight for yourself and say, the Word of God says, and search that thing out diligently and know how that thing goes and put the Word of God on. Don't worry about what Brother Martin says. They reject Brother Martin. Don't worry about what Brother Ruckman says. They reject him too. And they reject about 95% of the preachers. And so you give them what God says and you're going to have to search the thing out diligently. I never forget one time when I first got saved I got talking to somebody about the second coming of Jesus Christ about the Mount of Olives and that thing being flattened out, you know, and about Jesus Christ coming in from the Mount of Olives. And somebody says, where's that at? And I says, well, I read over here in John R. Rice's booklet. And uh, that doesn't work, folks. That don't work at all. And you better say, I find that thing back here in Zechariah chapter 14. It's back there. Let me show it to you. And take that thing and open, put it in their arms, you know, and say, here it is. Now read it. But you're going to have to search that thing out and find out what you believe and why you believe it. And the Bible says this salvation that you and I have, the prophets inquired and searched diligently, and they prophesied about it. You take Isaiah. Go back in Isaiah now, in Isaiah chapter number 53. And they got prophesied about the grace that should come. In Isaiah chapter 53, look at some things. You talk about the grace of God. Irvin, he likes to preach on down the street corner. And Irvin will get up there and stand and say, I'm going to preach to you on the grace of God today. And I want you to know that, number one, that grace is unmerited favor. And uh, grace is favor that you don't deserve. And that's true. You get reading about this thing here, the salvation you and I have. Look at verse number four, Isaiah 53. It says, Surely have borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes 
Christ, we're healed. You know what that is? That's a favor that Jesus Christ has done for you that you don't deserve. You don't deserve God to be kind to you that way. You don't deserve somebody to take your sins and your iniquities and your sorrows and your griefs. You don't deserve it, but he did it. That's the grace of God that's been manifested for you. And Isaiah wrote the thing and he prophesied and they didn't know exactly what was going on. I mean, the, uh, the nation of Israel to this day don't know what's going on. They get reading about the thing and they say, that's us. We suffer. We're the suffering servant. We're the ones. And you and I realize, according to the word of God in Acts chapter number 8, uh, the Bible says in relation to this passage here, uh, Philip preached unto him Jesus. And you and I realize that thing is a picture of the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number 10 it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. His soul was made an offering for sin. In verse number 12 it says, Therefore I divide him a portion with the great and shall... Divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Again, Isaiah chapter number 55. Isaiah 55, verse number 1, Isaiah prophesies of the grace that should come. And he says, Ho, he says, Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he says, uh, he that ha And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat, ye come buy wine and milk, without money and without price. And so that's a picture of the grace of God. Isaiah chapter 55, verse number 1, is somebody's thirsty, come to the water. Revelation 22 and verse number 17, come and drink, and you don't have to have any money. You don't have to have anything in your hands. Just simply come, and you're going to get your cup filled as far as your thirsty or soul is concerned. Picture of the grace of God. And the Bible says they searched that thing out. And they didn't, they didn't understand everything about it. It says in verse number 11, it says, Searching water, what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Take your Bible now and come to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, and you find out that uh, this is uh, perhaps an unusual situation. Most of the time you get reading about the Holy Spirit of God in the Old Testament, and you read about the Spirit of God coming upon them. Uh, you read about the Spirit of God being poured out upon them. But there are some times, in a few cases, where you read about the Spirit of God being in them. And here's a case in Isaiah uh, 63. And the Bible says back there in 1 Peter chapter 1, it says the Spirit of God was in them, and so they did signify and testify beforehand of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ and the glory that should follow. Uh, verse number 10, Isaiah 63. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Uh, and he's supposed to be the comforter, but they vexed his Holy Spirit. Wherefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he that brought them up by the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? That led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make him an everlasting name. That led them through the deep paths and horse in the wilderness that they should not stumble. And just as the Spirit of God is in you and I to lead you and I that we should not stumble, the Spirit of God was in them as far as the nation of Israel is concerned. And the Bible says he put his Holy Spirit within them. And sometimes even as far as an individual is concerned, you may find the Holy Spirit of God in them, but not as you do in the New Testament where every believer that takes Jesus Christ as his Savior as sealed by the Holy Ghost of God. He's put in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit of God and he has the Holy Spirit of God in him and he's going to abide forever and never leave him. But beforehand they had some things like that and the Bible says it testified of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And like I said, sometimes they're together in the same verse. And again in Isaiah, look at Isaiah chapter 61. You can pick it up in Isaiah 61 and verse number 1 and verse number 2. First coming, second coming, sufferings deal with the first coming, and uh, the glory deals with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 61 and verse number 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart, first coming, to proclaim liberty to the captives, first coming, and second coming, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, second coming, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, first coming, second coming. Take your Bible and go back to now a little bit further, back to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah chapter number 23, you find the same type of thing. Jeremiah 23 and about verse 5 or 6. Jeremiah 23 and about verse number 5. Verse number 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 23 and verse number 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. First coming. Watch the second coming. Comma. Only a comma separates it and says, And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. And, of course, that has to do with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a righteous branch, first coming. He's a, sec uh, a king, second coming. All in the same verse, Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse number 5. Go in your Bibles back to Genesis chapter number 49. 
Genesis chapter number 49. You pick it up back there in verse 10 and verse number 11. Genesis 49, verse number 10. Scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet. Middle of the verse, until Shiloh come. First coming, and on him shall be the gathering of the people be second coming. Shiloh come, first coming, on him shall the gathering of the people be second coming. All right, watch it again in verse number 11. Genesis 49, verse number 11. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass is cold unto the choice vine. First coming, as well as second coming. He washed his garments in wine. Second coming. Like read about in Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 3. Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 13. And his clothes in the blood of graves. His eyes should be red with wine, his teeth white with milk. And that has to do with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. First coming, second coming, verse 10. First coming, second coming in verse number 11. And so you can understand how that the prophets... Couldn't under, uh, they didn't really even know what they wrote. They'd write the thing down. This passage back in Daniel speaks about his suffering and his glory. And they didn't understand fully exactly what they were writing down. But they searched diligently. And they at least tried. I wonder tonight, are you trying? I wonder tonight, are you searching the Word of God diligently? I wonder tonight, are you working on the Word of God and seeing what's going uh, on in the Word of God for yourself? And the Bible says, unto him, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves. God showed them that, uh, listen, this is not for you right now, but later on, we'll show it to somebody. Right now, you simply write what I told you to write. All right? Uh, not unto themselves, but unto us. They did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things angels desire to look into. All right, they observed, and they, they constantly watched, and they, they sought and tried to figure things out according to the Word of God. Then in verse number 13, it says, Wherefore? All right, because of these kind of things, because you and I have a completed salvation, because the trials don't even need to shake us, because those trials are more precious than gold that perishes, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Or right, you and I, if we're wise, we're going to gird up the loins of our mind. You and I are going to build ourselves up, and we're not going to we're not going to live on some kind of a dream. We're not going to think, well, now that I'm saved, I'm never going to have another problem again. We're not going to say, well, listen, my troubles are over. I'm saved now. I know God's going to get me through. I won't have to do this, and I won't have to do that. And I can just sit around. And I can live by faith and walk by faith, and and I won't ever have to work again. I say, I won't have to do anything. Listen, that Bible says, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, be sober. You know, Brother Bruce MacDonald's a very wise man. I mean, to hear him preach, you think he's just somebody just ranting and raving, old stump jumping preacher. And, and you just never guess him to be as wise as what he is. You get talking to him about the Word of God, and he'll talk to you about the Word of God. You get talking to him about Calvinism, he'll talk to you about Calvinism. I mean, off the top of his head, brother, he'll give you answers. He'll give you some good stuff on it. I mean, you get talking about hyper-dispensationalism, and you can talk with him. He'll talk with you about it. But I'll tell you one of the wisest things that man ever told me he did. And here's what he said. He said, Brother Art, he says, knowing how things are going to go as far as the Word of God's concerned, he says, what I do, he says, I read books like, oh, maybe Wormbrandt, Popoff, some of those guys, Fox's Book of Martyrs. And he says, that thing builds up my mind. And that thing girds me. And that thing girds up the loads of my minds. So that if I ever face anything that's tough, he says, that thing won't throw me down. It won't drive me out of my mind. He says, that thing builds me up ahead of time as a warning. You get reading about some of them guys. You read about some of the things they go through. Wormbrandt, Popoff. One time they had Popoff eight inches from a wall. And he could see the outside, and they just kept him there for 14 straight days where he could see the outside, and he couldn't get to the outside, and just had him on just enough to keep him alive, just bread and water. I mean, a little bit of soup, a little bit of bouillon, and a little bit of water, uh, a little bit of bread there to, to go with that thing, just enough to get him by. And you know, you get reading about that thing and those guys, I mean, they got through it. If they got through it, you can get through it. John Bunyan got through it. You can get through it. You just have to gird up the loins of your mind and say, in case I'm going to build myself up, I'm going to read about that thing. I'm not going to act like it's not there. In case it ever hits, I want to know how to handle it, how they handle it, how they get through. And perhaps one day you and I get through that way. Gird up the loins of your mind. I mean, don't run from somebody that's been through something. Don't run from somebody that's suffering. Don't run from somebody that's facing some hardships. I mean, get around them. Find out how God ministers to them. And tuck that thing in your heart. I mean, tuck that thing in the loins of your mind. I mean, get that thing in there. And one day when you go through it, that thing's going to help you out. God's going to get you through. And says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Be sober. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And of course, you and I, the reason we can get through is because we've got hope at the end. we got hope that one day this church age is going to end very shortly and Jesus Christ is going to come back. 
They have hope as far as the tribulation is concerned, doctrine, that Jesus Christ is going to be revealed. I mean, that tribulation is only going to run so long, and Jesus Christ is coming back. And so as a result, they can face the thing. They can be sober going through the thing, and they can hope to the end and say, Listen, God, I need you to get me through. I need you to get me through. And, Lord, I'm looking for the day when you come back. I'm looking for that glad day when you come back. And that thing keeps us going on to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't handle that thing that way, you're going to go down. Take your Bible and I'll show you two cases of it. Go back to Matthew chapter number 24. And here's a case where somebody goes down. It says be sober. And of course, I'll show you another way in which you should be sober. But this is a case where somebody loses sight of the end. Somebody loses sight of the hope that's before them. And so somebody fades out and somebody doesn't make it like they should. Uh, Matthew 24 and verse number 42. It says, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this. That if the good man of the house had known what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, <clears throat> whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But in if that evil servant shall say in his heart, in his heart, instead of hoping, I mean, for, uh, for the end and for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. And so the Bible says in verse number 49, shall begin to smite his fellow servants and eat to drink with the drunken. And there's somebody that goes down because they get wearied and faint in their minds and they begin to say he's not coming back now. He's not coming back for a little while. And they quit hoping unto the end. And sometimes you and I guilty the same thing. We lose sight of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we get thinking, man, our troubles have overwhelmed us. And we get feeling like, man, I can't hardly go on. I can't hardly carry on anymore. But you can, and God wants you to. And you just gird up the loins of your mind, and you hope unto the end. And you get looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Go back to Daniel chapter number 7. Daniel chapter 7 and verse number 25. The devil is going to work him over in the tribulation. The devil is going to work you over right now. And the way he does it, the Bible says he gets him weary. In the New Testament, Paul says two times, he says, be not weary in well-doing. Uh, he says in verse uh, 9 of uh, Galatians 6, he says, in due season you shall reap if you faint not. But two times you're warned not to be weary in well-doing. And yet the fact remains that you get weary and sometimes I get weary. And uh, the Bible says here in, in uh, Daniel chapter 7 and verse number 24, the ten horns out of this kingdom, or ten kings. So you know you're dealing with a tribulation passage. That shall arise, and others shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. You know you're dealing with the Antichrist. Shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints. Shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until time, times, and dividing of times. All right, take your Bible now and go back to Hebrews. Go back in the New Testament and see how he wears them out. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 3. You find out exactly how he wears them out. He wears them slap out. How does he do it? And, of course, the Bible says back there he changes times and seasons. He changes laws. And you and I, some of the things they change and some of the laws they got going these days drive you crazy. I mean, the law this, these days is, I mean, it's reverse of what God intended it to be. I mean, the thing is supposed to be for the lawbreaker and... I mean, the law these days is uh, to benefit the lawbreaker and it's supposed to be against him, bring punishment and penalty to him and bring sin, a, a drive sin out of the camp. All right, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 3. For consider him, that is Jesus, consider him that endured such contradiction as sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. He'll wear you out and wear you out right here. He gets you to where you can't hardly even think straight anymore. He gets you to where you're just about to crack up. He gets you where you bog down. And the Bible says you become weary and faint in your minds. And so if you're wise ahead of time, you're going to gird up the loins of your mind and you'll take some of those books and you read them. You say, listen, God got them through. God ministered to them. God kept them from going crazy. God got through some terrible things and God get me through if I've got to face it too. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right. Verse number 14. As obedient children, not fasting yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Uh, Paul gets talking about how that he was ignorant back in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 13. And he says, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But he says, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. All right, if you was all that before you got saved, you certainly ought not to be that after you got saved. 
That Bible says, as obedient children, and not fastening yourselves according to the form of lust and your ignorance. I mean, a lost person, he's ignorant. I mean, he can be well-educated. He's ignorant uh, because of the way he lives. He's ignorant for rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul ignorantly blasphemed and persecuted Christians and compelled them to blaspheme and blaspheme that name himself. But he says, not no more. Don't do it anymore. In the Bible, Ephesians chapter number 4, the Bible says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with, those, with his own hands, that he may have to give to him that hath need. Rather than steal, you have enough to give to somebody that has need. And so your pattern of life has changed. Verse number 15, But as he which is holy, called you as holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now conversation in the Bible goes two ways. It goes what you say, right here. It goes what they see. And, of course, they say what you see is speak so loud I can't hear what you say. And so you want to realize that, that you're, you're a twofold witness to this world. I mean, your conversation goes two ways in the Word of God. In uh, 1 Peter chapter number 3, the Bible says they behold your chaste conversation. They see something. They see chastity in a woman. Uh, they see purity in a man. And he says to Timothy, he says, keep thyself pure, chaste. I mean, that type of thing is what God expects uh, out of the Christian. Uh, the ornament of meek and quiet spirit. And that which is not corruptible and various things of that nature, uh, God says, be ye holy. And he says, I've, uh, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Uh, it says, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, it doesn't say, as I am holy. You're not going to be as holy as God is. And there's some things that you and I can be holy in. You're not going to be as holy as he is. But because you and I live and serve a holy God, a living God, but one who's explicitly holy, one who's, I mean, absolutely sinless, holy in everything, uh, you and I are supposed to be holy people. You know, you get talking that way to Baptist people and they think they get saved, they're eternally saved. Now I can do what I want to do. But there's a place of holiness in the life of a Baptist. There's a place for holiness in your life, and God wants you to be holy. In the passage here, he says you're supposed to be holy. You take the gods that other nations serve, paganism serves, their gods were perverts. You get reading about some of those gods, and uh, they, were, uh, they were known for sexual excess, impurity, things of that nature. That was their gods. As a result, you find back there in days of Romanism, uh, early Rome back there, and days of uh, back there in Greece and various places of that nature. I mean, that was the pattern of life for those people. That was their God. But listen, you and I have got a different God. We've got a distinct God. We've got one who's the only and true God. And you and I are supposed to be holy people because of that. The Bible says, be ye holy, for I am holy. And verse number 17, if ye call him the Father, who without respect to persons judgeth according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning. Sojourning is a temporary stay. You're only here for a little while and on you go to the judgment. The Bible says pass the time of your sojourning uh, here in fear. It says for as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. All right, then you and I need to realize two things as far as the judgment is concerned. You need to realize that one day you and I God's going to judge you and I. When God judges you and I, God's going to judge you and I without respect of persons. Peter always talked that way. For example, take your Bible. Go back to Acts chapter number 10. And uh, you find that throughout the Word of God. You and I understand that. We know that. Uh, Peter, he was always talking that way. In Acts chapter 10, and verse number oh, 15, and verse number 28, and verse number 34, he gets talking about it. In verse number 15, and uh, he says, And the voice that spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. In the passage back here in First Peter, he says, God's going to judge without respect to persons. And so you and I need to realize that we treat them one and all alike. I mean, somebody comes in next weekend, impartiality as far as seating is concerned. I mean, not the big shots in the front and the middle people in the middle and the little people in the back. I mean, one and all, first come, first serve, and you treat them without respect to persons. And the Bible says, uh, whatever God's cleanse call not thou common. In verse number 28, he said unto them, you know how that is unlawful, uh, an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come in unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Then verse number 34. 
Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. God is no respecter of persons. And so you and I need to handle the thing the same way. Realize that you and I alike, we stand before uh, God. We stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And so you and I are to pass the time of our sojourning here in fear. And we don't treat anybody as unclean of God's cleansing. I mean, no matter where they came from, if they're saved, they're washing the blood of Jesus Christ. And they're spotless and pure, uh, washing his precious blood. And so you treat them uh, one life. Likewise, you need to realize that only for a little while we're here, and one day we stand before the judgment, and you stand, you get judged uh, by a holy God, and you get judged uh, and get exactly what you deserve. You get it one day at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Verse number 18, uh, you know. What do you know? Not redeemed with corruptible things. All right, that's for certain. As silver and gold. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. In Mark chapter number 7, the Bible says... You make the word of God of none effect by your tradition. And in the Bible, tradition is never spoken of well. In the Roman Catholic situation, tradition is put over top of the word of God. And everything is based upon tradition even more than on the word of God. But in the Bible, it's based upon the word of God. And tradition only causes people to reject the word of God and make the word of God of none effect. In the Bible, the only place tradition is spoken of well is in 2 Thessalonians. And Paul says there, he talks about the tradition that you've seen of me. And the tradition there was, if man don't work, neither shall he eat. And that's the tradition that has to be kept and that alone. But when it comes to salvation and redemption, it's not silver and gold. But the Bible says it's with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Verse number 20, who was ver verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. He's the eternal son of God, uh, but was manifest in these last times for you. He was back there. I mean, God, the Godhead was back there. Jesus Christ being part of the Godhead. There came a time when Jesus Christ left the Godhead and came down here and took upon him a body of flesh. And God was manifest in the flesh. First Timothy chapter three and verse number 16. Bible says, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. All right, you believe in God, not in feeling. I believe what God said, who do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. All right, 22, seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. All right, then you and I are to obey the truth. We purify our souls by what we're obedient unto. Take your Bible, notice for the Christian and for the matter of salvation, the obedience has to do with the faith and it has to do with the faith of the gospel. Go back to Romans chapter 10, look at verse number, oh, verse number 17, 16, Romans 10 and verse number 16. It says, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Or right, if you're going to purify your souls, you've got to be obedient. You've got to obey the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Now back up to Romans chapter 6 and verse number 17. Romans 6 and verse number 17. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. All right, the obedience has to be from the heart. Then Romans chapter number 1. Back up to Romans chapter number 1. And you find as far as salvation, Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 5. Obedience to the faith, obedience from the heart. Obedience to the gospel, that's what a man is saved by, and the purifying of his soul, purifying of his soul has to do with obedience uh, to the faith of the gospel, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So the Bible says in verse number 22, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth. Romans 1, Romans 6, Romans 10, through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. After you're saved, of course, the Bible says we know we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. And that love is supposed to be a tremendous love. It's supposed to be a love deep enough to where you'd be willing to die for one another. I mean, Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, and that a man lay down his life for his, uh, for his brothers, brethren, for the brethren, John chapter number 15. But the passage is, here says, uh, unfeigned love of the brethren. Then you don't just put it on the top, but you manifest your love one for another, and you ought to be willing even to die for each other. Take your Bible and come back to 1 John chapter 3 and look at verse number 23. 1 John 3 and verse number 23. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And look what follows. Same thing you read about in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 22. 
Number one, you believe on him. Obedience purifies your souls. And number two, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And God wants you and I to love each other. God wants you and I, and of course that's a mark of spiritual growth. If you love one another with a pure heart and with unfeigned love and love one another fervently, uh, that's a demonstration of somebody growing after they're saved. In verse number 23, the Bible says, being born again, not a corruptible seed. That's like your daddy's from your daddy. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, As an Adam all die, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. It lives and it abides forever. Verse number 23, But all flesh, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. All flesh is as grass. All right, take your Bible now and go back to Psalm 49. Watch what David says about back in Psalms. Psalm 49, pick up by three or four verses back there. Verse number 12 to begin with. Psalm 49, verse number 12. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perish. All right, verse number 14. Like sheep they are laid in the grave, death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. Verse number uh, 16, Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away, his glory shall not descend after him. Verse number 20, Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. And you and I need to realize that uh, all the glory of man is as the flower of the grass, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. Take your Bible and go to Jeremiah chapter number 9. Jeremiah 9 and verse number 23, and notice what men glory in. Jeremiah 9 and verse number 23. They glory in their riches. They glory in their strength. They glory in their beauty. But you and I need to realize that stuff is so fleeting, not hardly worth speaking about. Jeremiah 9 and verse number 23, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. And you and I have nothing to glory in. Uh, the Bible says only the word of God, it liveth and abideth forever. And our flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. It withereth and fadeth away. The Bible says, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. You know, that's very humiliating when you get thinking about it. In the Bible, the Bible says you and I not to worry. It speaks about how that God clothed uh, the fields and the lilies of the field and how tremendously and, and the glory of them there. Uh, back in Matthew chapter 6. But you know, you get reading about the glory of them and two verses later you find out, I mean, that they, they just fade and they just fall away and it's gone. And you and I, likewise, we need to realize if there's any glory ever attached to us, be it wisdom, be it might, be it riches, no matter what it is. Listen, friend, it's only for a short time and we're gone and you better be wise and you better glory in the Lord. I never forget when I was younger, I used to love golf. I haven't even played this year. Thought I was going to play it in my back. Give me trouble and that pretty well polished it off. But there was a fellow that I used to watch. This guy's name was Arnold Palmer. People used to go crazy over him. That fellow had a following. They called it Arnie's Army. I never forget one time I watched him in the United States Open. It was out in Denver, Colorado. I think about 1960, early 60s there. And anyhow, he played that open out at Cherry Hill Country Club. And I think coming on about the last night, or at least the last day, probably the last day, that fellow was seven strokes off the pace. And you know that fellow, I mean, he, everybody watched that guy. I mean, he hit that ball, and brother, he charged. I mean, he, he hit that thing right for the cup, and he come on, and he won that tournament. I mean, people just went crazy over Arnold Palmer. But you know, you stop and think about Arnold Palmer now, that fellow's still on the trail. He's still out there, a gray-haired old man, I mean, like the rest of us. I mean, you get old and you get gray. And, I mean, he's on the trail there and still playing. You know, that fellow hasn't won a golf tournament since 1975. And you know what that shows you? That shows you the glory of man. I mean, it just fades and it just falls away. And you and I, listen, we better be wise, man. We better go by the word of God and glory in the Lord. You take on other hand as far as women are concerned. They always glory in their beauty. They glory in their hair, things of that nature. There was a lady back there, a young lady that... She was pretty well favored as far as uh, God put her together pretty well. And she had a lot of attention. She was a movie actress. Her name was Jane Mansfield. You know, one time she was going, I think it was between Pensacola and New Orleans, near near New Orleans there uh, one time, and, well, back in the 60s also. 
and she's going down that highway and she, I think, run into the back of a truck. I forget how it was in the middle of the nighttime. And that thing, I mean, she had an accident there that sheared the top of the car off and took her head along with it. And I'll tell you what, you stop and think about that. And the fellow saw that thing. I mean, there was whole, uh, there was there was blood all over the highway there. I mean, a mangled up car and a mangled up body. And I mean, a decapitated form there. I mean, you think about that situation. Got to call the fire trucks out to hose the blood off the road. And that simply shows you that all the all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man is a flower of grass. Yeah. It withers and the flower thereof falls away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is a word by which the gospel is preached unto you. And you know, that's a, that's a familiar situation there. The Bible says we do all fade as a leaf. We're all as an unclean thing. We all fade as a leaf. And I mean, you one day you're going to be over the hill. One day you're going to be coming down the other side. You better watch who you meet going up the ladder. You're going to meet them coming back down. That glory fades and falls away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And a very familiar situation in the word of God. Take your Bible and go back to Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter number 13. And notice in relation to the Word of God, it's supposed to be glorified. Not you and I, but the Word of God is to be glorified. Acts chapter 13 and verse number 44. Paul's preaching in Antioch at the city of there, and the Bible says because of the Word of God going forth, it says in the next Sabbath day, and brother, he had a message for him. He got preaching about Moses, uh, about, uh, yeah, Moses and got their attention there. Then he changed the thing over to Jesus in verse number 30, and he talked about him being raised from the dead. And then he talked about eternal security in verse number 34, the sure mercies of David. And then in verse number 38, he talked about forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ and not Moses. And then verse number 35, he didn't just talk about forgiveness, he talked about justification. And then the Bible says in verse number 44, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of, the, the word of God. And the Jews, they became envious of it, and they got all tore up about it. And then verse number uh, 48, And when the Gentiles heard this, that is, Paul said to the Jews, he says, You judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. We're going to turn to the Gentiles. Then 48, when the Jew, Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Then verse number 49, and the word of the Lord was published throughout the region. That's typical. I mean, they hear the word of God. They glorify the word of God. They're to publish the word of God. Go to Acts chapter number 19. Acts chapter 19 and verse 19 and 20. Acts 19 and verse number 19. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they come the price of them, that is, any book that would uh, teach you hypnosis, any book that would teach you any form of witchcraft, would be whatever it might be, curious arts. It says they brought them books, brought the books together and burned them before all men. And they come, the, man, you'd have to burn the Apocrypha. Amen. That thing teaches witchcraft in Tobit. <laughs> Chapter, uh, I forget, I'll give it to you if you ask me for it later on. It, anyhow, it says, and burn them before all men. And they come, that's a good idea, <laughs> and come the price of them and found 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. And the word of God always prevails over everything. I mean, no matter what kind of books they are, the word of God prevails over it. No matter who it is, the word of God prevails over them. And the word of God prevailed over the Jews. It'll prevail over you and I. The word of God is to be glorified by you and I. Take your Bible and go to Acts chapter number 12. Acts chapter number 12, verse number 21. Upon a set day, Herod, King Herod. Upon a set day, Herod's arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is a voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of the worms and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And folks, I'll tell you what, that's true throughout the word of God. It just seems like man, woman, or whoever they might be. I mean, at their best, their glory lasts for just a short time. Maybe five or ten years, it just doesn't matter how long it might be. It's just a very short time. Uh, you take 50 years alongside of uh, eternity, the Bible calls it a moment. Just simply a moment. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And it's just a very small time. And the Bible says it just withers and fades away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. And you and I, we need to glory not in records of our own. Not in whether or not we're the, uh, perhaps won more souls than anybody else or done something bigger or better than anybody else. Uh, you get thinking about some of these people like they say, where are the snows of yesteryear? 
And you and I, it's like the Bible says, it's better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in princes. It's better to trust in the Lord, put confidence in man, because the only thing that's going to stand when the showdown comes is the Word of God. And that's why around here the emphasis is number one on Jesus Christ and His Word. Because the Word of the Lord endureth forever. You and I need to be thankful. Need to be thankful because even through trials, God will bring those things out if we handle them right. They're precious unto us. And at the appearing of Jesus Christ, He Himself will praise us. You and I need to, number one, extend ourselves. In the respect of, we need to go beyond the normal. We need to search diligently the Word of God. We need to search the Scriptures. We need to search the Bible daily, see whether these things are so. We need to get in there and search the Word of God. Extend yourself. Don't just come in here on Sunday and get what Brother Martin can put on you. Search the thing out for yourself. Search it diligently. Extend yourself. Again, you and I need to extend ourselves by girding up the loins of our minds. Not just searching the Word of God, but there's some, I even add additional reading. Paul spoke about the books back there in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 13. So you read the scriptures especially, but you read also some other books and you build yourself up and you gird up the loins of your mind and say, Brother Martin, but I don't have time and I'm tired. Listen, friend, I don't have time and I'm tired too, but I'm going to gird up the loins of my mind. Listen, I'm reading books. I got stacks of books everywhere in that house. I got five or six books in this pile, five or six in that pile, three or four sitting on my desk at all times, three or four sitting on the bed over there. I'm reading every moment I possibly can. Inside of that time, I'm reading also other books. Listen, I'm girding up the loins of my mind. And you and I, we need to do, we need to extend ourselves. Then again, number two, you and I need to be an example that we're sons. Uh, example that you and I are sons. In verse number 14, uh, the Bible says, as obedient children. And as uh, an example, you and I need to be a holy example. I mean, if we're sons of God, we're to be holy. Uh, in conversation, verse number 15. In consideration, verse number 17. And you'll be able to prove yourself even this coming weekend. I mean, listen, dear friend, no respect to persons. There are no big shots as far as we're concerned. Amen. And you and I need to handle one and all alike. I mean, take somebody who's weakened. I mean, even spiritually. And you don't drive them down. You don't work them over. But listen, dear friend, you do your best to consider yourself. And, and you could go down just as easily as they did. And you now need to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ and be an example that we're sons of God, holy sons of God, connected with the holy God, the true God. We need to be an example that, uh, in our heart. Our heart needs to be a pure heart. It needs to be a heart that loves one another. Loves one another, not just a little bit. Loves one another fervently. And of course, if you love somebody fervently, you'll pay a price. You'll be willing to pay a price for them. We need to be an example that in our heart we love fervently the spotless Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That Bible says there in verse number 19, He's a precious, uh, you're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Why should I love Him? Well, listen, dear friend, if you want to find out how precious the thing is, figure out what it would take to replace it. Could Fort Knox replace the blood of Jesus Christ? I mean, could the gold the Arabs have replace the blood of Jesus Christ? No, in no way can you replace the blood of Jesus Christ. Then the blood of Jesus Christ is the most precious thing that you and I know anything about. And you and I love Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God, who redeemed you with His precious blood. Measure it. And don't forget what sad condition you'd be in had not Jesus shed that blood. Number three, excite your seed. By that I'm talking about verse number 23. There's a part of you, if you're redeemed, that needs excited. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God. And you and I have a seed within our bodies, within our uh, souls. You've got a seed that's incorruptible. And that seed needs excited. It needs excited the fact that it's going to live forever. It's not going to corrupt. It's not going to be like the bodies. I've got something inside of me that's going to live forever got a seed inside of me it's incorruptible bless your heart
for chapter number two. We'll cover it next time. You need to exhort your spirit. That is you and I, we've got a new nature. And that new nature is supposed to lay aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. And then you're supposed to give up some things there. Exhort your new spirit to, the Bible says we're partakers of his divine nature. And you and I have to give up some things. We need to give up malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings and then grow up. And we grow up by the word of God. Verse number two is newborn babes. Desire the sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby. You know, the, the Bible mentions a lot of foods. It mentions bread. It mentions manna. It mentions honey. It mentions quails. It mentions locusts. It mentions grapes. It mentions apples. It mentions venison. It mentions fish. It mentions cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. It mentions a fatted calf. It says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. And you and I, we need to put emphasis on the word of God. And we need to forget about all this stuff, even this building here. We're thankful for it. We appreciate the facilities. Wish it could have been a little bit bigger, but uh, we're just thankful to have what we got. We're going to make the best of it. We're going to keep a good spirit. We're going to do our best. And, and we're just going to enjoy it next weekend. But I'll tell you what. More than the building, and more than the crowds, and more than anything else. I don't care what kind of record we might break or whatever else goes on. That doesn't mean anything at all. But the Word of God endureth forever. And we're going to get into it. We're going to drink. And we're going to eat. And we're going to feast. And we're going to dine. And we're going to emphasize till Jesus Christ comes back. That which is going to be standing. And it's not this building. But the Word of the Lord endureth forever that's bound for a word of prayer dear father in heaven we thank you lord for the word of god and we're so thankful lord you preserved it wouldn't do no good lord for you to inspire it and then lose it that would mean nothing but lord we're glad that you promised to preserve it we're so thankful you have we're so thankful lord we're in america here where we can buy copies of it we can get copies of it free and father we count the privilege to put out your word lord help us to publish the word of god help us lord to put it out everywhere we go Father, may the word of God be glorified. And Father, I pray that tonight we might renounce the flesh. I pray these Christian people here, no matter who they are and what they've been glorying in, I pray, Lord, they realize they're just simply glorying their own ungodly flesh. And the flesh is no good and it's going to fail and especially it's going to wither and fade away. God helps the glory in you Amen. and in your word and in the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray next weekend emphasis be put on the right thing Amen. Lord I just pray now that you'd give us the right kind of a spirit Amen. give us a good prayer meeting this Wednesday night Lord may we love each other and pray for each other and care for each other love one another with a pure heart fervently Amen. Lord I pray that any bitterness any hard feelings any hypocrisies that may be around this place Lord I pray that be put underneath the blood of Jesus Christ and Amen. A precious love be known once again. And Father, we ask to be led by your spirit. We're, Lord, we're not good for anything but messing up. Amen. And Lord, we need wisdom. We need sense to think right. And we need you to lead us, Lord. And so we're calling upon you. And we're just so thankful, Lord, for, for what you've done for us. Good to be born again, incorruptible seed that liveth and abideth forever. We rejoice in you. Help these Christians to rejoice. Bless the ones, Lord, that are perhaps going through trials right now. Lord, I wouldn't know who that might be, but Lord, I ask you to bless them. Bless Miss Tucker and Mom with their physical afflictions. And Pop, Lord, I pray you'd lift them and others, Lord. And I pray for my mother, Lord. I pray you'd encourage her heart and minister to her, Lord. And, and Lord, that somebody would love her fervently. And God, we just call upon you. And Father, we seek your face in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand to feet now and do a little...